welcome to the first installment of my video blog. I'm really excited about doing this for a lot of reasons, but mainly because it gives me another way of interacting with you. I've always been deeply interested in the brain. Funny enough, I majored in neuroscience way back in college. Not coincidentally, the brain is the target organ of my work as an anesthesiologist. And unfortunately, taking care of patients with injuries to the brain is part and parcel of my job, both at the hospital and when I worked at circuits all around the world. For the past decade or so, I've been fascinated to see the drumbeat of information, articles, and TV programs about concussion. Every week, and sometimes twice a week, there are lead articles in major newspapers and magazines about some aspect of concussion. By the way, concussion is also often called mild or minimal traumatic brain injury, MTBI. And it's safe to use these as synonyms. But even though I might occasionally use the abbreviation MTBI in order to say concussion, I don't really like the implications of the words mild or minimal in this context, and we'll soon see why. If you live in the States, the NFL, and to a lesser extent the NHL, are both in the midst of managing a growing wave of retired players suffering from the long-term consequences of multiple concussions. And hard as it might be to imagine, I'm convinced that the resolution of this crisis will ultimately have an enormous and maybe even existential impact on the future of that sport. Most of the planet just recently witnessed three of the most shocking images of concussion mismanagement ever aired, just a few weeks ago during the World Cup in Brazil. I'm sure you all felt just as frustrated as I did to see these clearly injured players being returned to play on the pitch. No matter where you are, no matter where you live, you can't escape the near constant coverage of MTBI these days. In the midst of all this noise, I want to talk to you about three trends I see emerging from this fascinating cacophony of the science of concussion. I want to think through some of the practical implications with you so we can draw some conclusions about how we work, how we play, and about the decisions that we make. But before we go any further, I need to define what a concussion is. Well, the definition is really pretty simple. Basically, a concussion is any problem with brain function after a force is applied to the head. Now, I insist on the problem with function because brain structure, as close as we can determine using CAT scans and MRI, is normal. By definition, pictures we take of the brain of a concussion patient are normal. Now, the kind of functional things we might see in someone with concussion include subjective symptoms, headache, dizziness, nausea, sleepiness, fuzziness. Uh, they may include objective signs, a dazed stare, slow blinking, disorientation, amnesia, other neurological signs. But there can also be behavioral changes, obstinacy, belligerency, aggressiveness, inappropriate hilarity, inappropriate sadness. The brain can really be affected in all its functions. None of this should, should surprise us, of course, and it shouldn't surprise us because of the complexity of the brain. Now, let's remember, the nerve cells or neurons that make up the brain are beautiful cells, and they're made to communicate with hundreds or sometimes thousands of their fellows through cell-to-cell -cell connections. Now, this means that the neurons are intricately branched at their input end to receive information, at their output end to transmit that information to other cells. In the average brain, there are 85 billion connections. 85 billion, that's almost as many connections as there are stars in our galaxy. And every one of those connections is a marvel of microscopic architecture. So really, there's nothing that surprising to realize that when the brain receives a significant blow, the function of these delicate, invisible and fantastically sophisticated little jewels of design can be disrupted. And of course, until these connections start working normally again, the result is changes in the way the brain sees and hears and thinks and reacts. The first trend I want to highlight here is one of the legacies of what our soldiers faced in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
You know, when these IEDs go off, there's a blast wave that radiates out from them. And like the ripples on a pond, this spherical shell of super-pressurized air, thousands of times higher than normal atmospheric pressure, carries huge amounts of energy. And it does damage with that energy anywhere there's an interface of two things with different densities. Think air over here, bricks over here, different density, kabloom. As it turns out, the brain is full of areas of different density. There are areas that, like, that are like runny pudding, and there are areas that are like stiff jello. There are areas that contain fluid-filled blood vessels right next to areas that have cabling running through them with, at high density. This patchwork of different densities throughout the brain make that organ extremely sensitive to blast effects. That's why one of the things that was seen all the time in otherwise uninjured soldiers exposed to IED explosions was, you guessed it, MTBI. Doctors at first were amazed to see in these concussed soldiers a very high incidence of post-traumatic stress disorder and of other behavioral changes, depression, substance abuse, alcoholism, even cognitive decline. At first they thought that these changes reflected the trauma of war, the trauma of losing friends and comrades and of the rigors of combat. But more and more the people caring for these soldiers realized that they might in fact be seeing the late effects on the brain of severe concussions. And limited data from the autopsies of some of these concussed soldiers who went on to commit suicide have tended to confirm that their brains showed the sequelae of these enormous shock waves, of these significant concussions. What's the practical implication of this sad but seemingly distant problem? Well, first of all, you see why I kind of don't like the terms minimal or mild when we're talking about concussion. Concussion at best is highly unpleasant and at worst can lead to significant social, academic, and professional issues. And I think the important lesson for us is the following. Even one really big concussion can have very long-lasting effects. Now, of course, the kind of forces involved in these IED explosions are way beyond almost anything we see in the civilian world. But if you or a loved one do experience a concussion and you do feel that there have been emotional changes or personality changes or changes in the cognitive function of your brain, you need to know that this is normal, that it almost always gets better, and that help is available. Increasing awareness of post-concussive syndrome means that many specialties are becoming more and more involved with this problem. And you can seek out help from neurologists, neurosurgeons, neuropsychologists, rehabilitation physicians, sports physicians, any number of professionals are there for you. All these folks are available and involved in helping people with concussion to recover better and faster. Ask questions and don't stop asking until you get answers. Even though the World Cup is over, I want to return to soccer because it's the sport that's feeding our second trend. We just considered the long-term effects of one massive concussion. Now we're going to look at the other end of the spectrum. Does anything bad happen if the brain is subjected not to one big hit, but to hundreds or maybe thousands of low energy impacts? Impacts that don't produce symptoms by themselves at all. Information coming from soccer players at various levels, from high school right up to pro, suggests a direct correlation between the number of heads a player makes in his career and the appearance of post-concussive symptoms. But remember, no one of these impacts in itself was strong enough to produce any symptoms at all. The New York Times just reported that the members of the championship-winning 1999 U.S. women's soccer team have just called publicly for guidelines to be issued on heading the ball. And they've also called for heading to be banned in players younger than 15 years of age. Now, this is scary. 
there's evidence of brain injury from repeated seemingly harmless hits. Whoa! Is there a safe lower limit of energy? What's the nature of this interaction between the force and the number of repetitions? What are the effects of age on the sensitivity to these low energy impacts? We, we know that's an important question because we know that the 15-year-old brain and younger is exquisitely sensitive to concussion. Are the different functions of the brain, language, memory, math, judgment, equally sensitive to these effects? All these questions, as you can see, are incredibly important and we need answers to them. And unfortunately, no good answers are there yet. That's why this trend makes it to number two. What are we going to do about this? Well, I think the first thing is we need to follow this space. Answers to these questions are a work in progress. And you need to be responsible when making recreation decisions for yourself or for your loved ones. Remember, it's starting to look like there may not be a lower limit of energy and that most unprotected hits to the head should be avoided. Period. Where you situate your personal risk-benefit ratio really depends on accurate information. And to get that accurate information, we're going to have to stay on top of this subject. And finally, our third trend brings some good news. It looks like all the attention to just how important concussion is, is starting to pay off. You know, over the past few years, a new generation of helmets for American football has been developed. These are now manufactured based on research in order to reduce the kind of forces specifically associated with concussion, at least in theory. Well, early data is now starting to look like these helmets are indeed reducing these injuries. And better still, this technology is starting to be applied to ice hockey helmets too. This is fantastic news, but there's always more work to be done. If you play a sport or have a job, that requires you to wear a helmet, find out what the homologation rules are for the headgear you're required to wear. Much like in American football, in Formula One, focused research led to developing the most robust motorsports helmet ever seen. Why not for other sports? Start to agitate to make your helmets as good as ours are. Well, there you have it. This is a fascinating story, and it's a story that impacts our lives almost every day. Thanks for watching. If you have questions or comments, make sure you leave them here. And don't forget to read my blog, follow me on Twitter, and come back next time.